Andy Olivastro, Vice President of Outreach at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you for being here today. Thank you to all those watching online. We'll jump right into it. Vivek Ramaswamy is a New York Times bestselling author and an entrepreneur who has founded multiple successful enterprises. A first-generation American, he founded Royvant Sciences in 2014, led the largest biotech IPOs of 2015 and 2016, eventually culminating in successful clinical trials in multiple disease areas that led to FDA-approved products. He has founded other successful healthcare and technology companies and in 2022 launched Strive Asset Management. That's a new firm focused on restoring the voices of everyday citizens in the American economy and leading companies to focus on excellence over politics. Vivek was born and raised in Southwest Ohio. He graduated from Harvard and Yale Law School and still turned out okay. <laughs> he is a prominent national voice on capitalism, free speech, and identity politics. He has graced our stage before and we're pleased to welcome him here again today. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Vivek to the stage. All right, Vivek, Nation of Victims. This is a, there's a through line from your first book, Woke Inc., to this book. But maybe tell us a little bit about that, but maybe through the lens of what is going on with our national psyche right now? Yeah, <laughs> that's a, it's, a, it's a big question. So, so uh, for those, those of you who weren't familiar with it, this is a, a sequel to my, my first book, which was Woke Inc., Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. And the thesis of that book was that corporate America was seizing on modern progressivism as a way to actually aggregate not only greater market power, but greater political power. Now, the unanswered there was two unanswered questions at the end of that book uh, that caused me to write this one as the sequel. The first is, why is our consumer base and the general population falling for it? In a certain sense, it takes two to tango. Companies are only going to behave this way if we live in a culture that's receptive to the products of what those companies deliver, not just their actual products, but their messages. And I think the diagnosis I came to at the end of that last book is that there's a, there's a black hole of identity at the heart of an entire generation, my generation and younger, millennials and Gen Z, that's actually hungry for a cause, hungry for a sense of purpose and meaning and identity. And the kinds of things that used to fill that hunger for purpose and meaning and identity in the past, faith, patriotism, national identity, hard work even can be a source of identity. Those have receded in modern American life. And if we don't fill that void with something more meaningful, that's really what allows poison to fill the void, be that a victimhood narrative, uh, a woke ideology, or a secular religion that we fail to recognize as actually a religion. That's where I left the last book off. So the goal of this book was to take a humble crack at maybe what might be the beginning of filling that void of national identity with a shared vision of American identity built around the unapologetic pursuit of excellence as a substitute for what I see as our current national identity in this moment right now, which is a national identity built around victimhood narratives. And so at a 50,000 foot level, that's what the book's about. And, and one of the things that you, the, the way you've talked about the book certainly is that in the victimhood Olympics, there is no gold medal. That's right. And I, I would love you to unpack that a little bit. Yeah. For the group <laughs> today. So, so look, uh, th there's, a, there's a chapter in the book, uh, there's two chapters in the book people told me not to include, okay? <laughs> Uh, the, the first is a chapter on, on black victimhood narratives in the United States. And I think that they say, you can't write that because you're not black. I, I don't believe in that. I think that I don't, regardless of the color of your skin, we're going to have to be able to express ideas out in the open if we care about addressing our shared challenges. And I think that there is no doubt in my mind that one of the things that's holding many black Americans, young black Americans back today is the victimhood narrative that they're repeatedly that they're repeatedly fed which is actually i think the greatest form of shackles or oppression that we could uh, that we could you know impose on an entire generation but i'm increasingly concerned that the conservative response or that the reactionary response offers a new narrative of white victimhood in in crude terms conservative victimhood is the chapter of the other is, is the title of the other chapter that i was told not to include in this book and my concern is exactly as, as you put it, that we are responding to a progressive grievance culture, not with a narrative of reviving excellence as an alternative to victimhood, 
but instead to play the competition of grievance, the grievance Olympics, the, uh, the oppression Olympics, the victimhood Olympics. And you're right, there is no gold medalist. It is America as a nation that loses in the end. And it's a, it's a hard thing to call for. And part of what the heart of the book is about is building this bridge. But how do we move from this victimhood Olympics where you say, oh, well, you guys think you're victims? Well, guess what? Here's all the bad things that have happened to us. And I'm an even bigger victim. And then I talked about black victim and white victim. And I'll tell you first personally, right? I, I'm a kid of immigrants. My parents came here. Im many immigrants who come here through the front door come here to be underdogs, not victims, but scrappily working hard through their own hard work and dedication, living the arc of the American dream. And if you grow up in that household, even as a first generation American, that's an in it's intricately woven into your upbringing and your experience. But in the, if I look into the second and third generation now, my kids' generation and younger, now the Asian American kids are thinking of, them, of themselves as persons of color, reinventing narratives of the hardships that they faced, which ironically, it's their parents and their grandparents who actually faced greater hardships than they did, but reinventing hardship as a form of currency to realize that actually if you're an Asian American today, that's how you're going to get into college. It's not going to be on your SAT scores because those have been eliminated anyway. It's going to have to be reinventing a narrative of how you face some hardship that you imagined for yourself. And so, so I think that that's <laughs> at least the title of the book. We are a nation of victims, left, right, black, white, gay, straight, we are competing for victimhood identities. And the question I ask in the book is, how do we build the bridge from a national identity centered on victimhood to reviving that shared national identity around the unapologetic pursuit of excellence? And, and the unfortunate part is there are no easy answers, but I think that there are the beginnings of some answers that I think lead us through some uncomfortable places. And that's why you know I, I chose to write the book about it. And, and in many ways, this conversation you know, your first book focused a lot on corporate America yeah, and, the influence of, and, and the influence of corporate America on American society, of course, but also around the globe. Why, why would somebody who wrote a book on corporate America end up talking about a nation of victims? What's the connection between these two things? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the connection is, I think that corporate America's behaviors are really in some ways a cause no doubt about it. I think that leaders of institutions do have a role in shaping our behavior, but they're also just a reflection of the underlying culture as well. And, and I think the answer is it's a little bit of both. And so, you know, the last book took a real look at how the cynical marriage between the, you know, left wing political movement in this country and big business to strange bedfellows, if you think about it, it's a bit of a curiosity of how they came to form an alliance, an arranged marriage between two parties who really didn't love each other. You know, it's, it's an arranged marriage in which each side has quiet disdain for the other party. It's more like mutual prostitution, actually. Each side gets something out of the act and leads to the birth of a, you know, of a you know, bastard child and of the woke industrial complex. That's what the whole last book was about. But, but, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it, that, 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 that offers a causal account for, for how sort of there's a, there's a top-down elitist imposition of a certain set of values. But that was really, if I was looking in the mirror at the end of that book, it's only really half the story. I think it is in some ways just responsive to a culture that is demanding that victim, victimhood narrative to be fed to them like a, you know, like a drug addict craze for cocaine. What is it that makes the drug addict, our culture in this case, so hungry for feeding that addiction. And it was that, it was, I ended that last book with the question, the, the chapter, last chapter of Woke Inc. was entitled, Who Are We? The title of the chapter. And, and, and the, the thesis was that we have this black hole of a vacuum at the heart of American identity. I felt like it was incomplete to just offer a scathing indictment of that cultural status quo without at least making an attempt to talk about what, what might fill that void. And I think that we, you know, I said we as you know conservative movement, there maybe there's a diverse audience in here, but I think that we as a movement broadly are are too good at pointing out the hypocrisies on the other side. I, I did that for the better part of the last couple of years. Woke Inc. was largely about that. But I think that we're we're not good enough about doing the harder work of offering an affirmative alternative vision, an affirmative alternative identity. And I'll give you one example of, you know, I talk about the path back from victimhood back to excellence. Look, I think that it runs through some, some complicated and unexpected places in that, you know, each of us as an individual, we hunger for the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of the American dream through the system of free market capitalism. 
that's part of my identity as American. I would venture to say it's part of probably every person in this room's identity as an American. But I think there's another half of the story, too, and the, not one that we talk about enough. And by failing to talk about it, we kind of miss the point. It's the half of our identity that also hungers for unity, for being part of a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think that's the contradiction, the tension at the heart of American identity is the hunger for that individual pursuit of the American dream, but also the hunger to be part of a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts lived out through our constitutional republic and our democratic form of self-governance. And, and I think that one of the counterintuitive theses in this book is that actually we can unapologetically pursue excellence even more effectively if we revive our notion of civic duty. What does it mean to be a citizen? And I think what does it mean to be a citizen comes not only with the freedoms, and I'm, I'm a, we're both lovers of freedom, but I think of one of the preconditions for freedom to actually see it play out in a society is to also talk more and think more about the civic duties that come with being a citizen. And I don't think that's something that the conservative movement has thought about or owned enough. And if we answer that question, it dilutes the poisonous threats to liberty, to excellence, to the American dream more effectively than just critiquing the hypocrisies in that counter movement. And so that gets a little philosophical, but I think it's probably the most important part of, of the message. Well, it, it, it gets to the concept, which you write about in the book, and you've talked about this before, about cultivating and creating new institutions as well, and the need to do that. Um, not only are you a best-selling author, you've created all these businesses and been successful in that effort. Strive Asset Management seeks to answer some of that, not all of that perhaps, but there's a, the concept that a successful business improves the human condition is something that I've always believed. I share that belief, yeah. And, and so but what you've done is you've said, not only am I going to comment on this, not only am I going to articulate a point of view and carry that across the country and around the world, you've created some businesses to advance this. Why is that part of the solution? Yeah, so I am not a believer in a silver bullet approach to a complex set of cultural challenges. I think the, the best we can hope for is a plethora of partial solutions. Okay, so, so I'm gonna just preface it by saying that. Everyone wants to talk their book and talk about what why they're doing is, is, is the singular end all be all answer. I'm not gonna do that. But I do think an underappreciated area for driving change is driving change through the market itself. And, and you know, we're here in Washington DC. I think you guys do incredibly important work in driving clear-headed public policy. I think that's an important frontier. I think reviving and changing our education system, both K through 12 as well as, as well as higher education is really important. Great people are working on each of those frontiers. I didn't, what I was surprised was to see market actors that fail to not only do their part, but fail to capture a business opportunity. Where right now, I mean, the state of affairs in America is, I think there's probably 100 to 150 million consumers, everyday Americans who are badly disaffected from the places where they shop, where they invest, where they work, where they bank. And guess what? Some of those 100 to 150 million Americans happen to be some of the best customers that any business could wish for. Yet no major mainstream business was actually effectively targeting that customer base with a message that respected them, precisely because of this strange cultural dislocation, this victimhood obsessed narrative in modern American life. And so I said, you know what, rather than just talking about this, let's build a business in the one industry that's upstream of all of the others in asset management. And so we created a business called Strive to compete with large financial institutions like BlackRock and Vanguard to invest the money of everyday citizens into the economy, starting with just index funds, right? So not claiming to be better at picking stocks or, or better at driving investment performance, just offering exposure to the market like Vanguard does, like BlackRock does but with a different message and a different voice and vote. And people forget that if you own a share in a company, you not get not only the financial entitlement, you get a voice and a vote as a shareholder. And we said, you know, the voice and the vote we'd bring to the table is one that actually rhymes with a lot to the, the subheader to this book, focusing companies exclusively on the pursuit of excellent products and services, yes, for profit, without apologizing for it, without regard to any social or political agenda. Full stop. And I'm, I'm proud to say, I mean, we're, we launched only our first month, for first fund uh, last month, but we're already, in our second one this month, we're already over, you know, $300 million in assets under management, mostly as best we can tell, driven by everyday citizens. 
and and you know you may have seen the letters that I've been writing as a shareholder to the boards of directors of Chevron to Apple to Disney all of those are in the last month specifically not just pointing this out as a commentator or an author but now as a shareholder speaking on behalf of everyday american citizens whose money is invested in those companies to not ask them politely but to mandate them to get back to focusing on products and services for profit and to do it unapologetically and and i think that, that when i talk about this pursuit of excellence in american culture there's there's a key addendum i'd like to add to that which is it isn't just about the pursuit of excellence it is about the unapologetic pursuit of excellence to pursue success and if you're a company yes that can mean profit without having to apologize for it and i think that it's this apologist culture that i think has given given way to the anti meritocratic way of american life from our educational system to our government to yes the private sector as well and so everyone can't ta- one person's not going to tackle all of those frontiers but the reason i was drawn to this one was that i felt like there were too few people focused on the market as an avenue for driving change and and so i thought i would take my turn and you you must have been very pleased an assumption on my part so i'll ask you must have been very pleased with the response that you got from excellent people that staff your company you you when you launched drive not only did our good friend justin danoff join you there but you've gotten so many wonderful people to join your company that must have been a good sign for you that there are professionals out there that want to pursue excellence and want to advocate for that in the marketplace yeah to say people are hungry for this is an understatement people are starving for this I, you know i've got uh, justin and rachel here uh, are my colleagues who you know justin joined earlier rachel joined more recently uh, you know both uh, natives of DC and bef- before but have uh, bought homes in central ohio uh, more recently to join us in that mission uh, we wanted to be sure that we were doing this if you're going to change the heart of the economy and the heart of the country uh, you want to do it from the heart of the country rather than from its from its edges um, but at the end of the day we have been flooded by interest even from folks who work at places like blackrock and state street and vanguard our two co-heads of our institutional business that that sell into the states for example both came from state street And you know what I actually really respect somebody who was in an environment that they saw by the way change. Some of these companies they're not the same Vanguard, you know, for example, even BlackRock. These aren't the same companies they were even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. And people who saw that evolution were frustrated by it, didn't really have the ability to do something within, but vote with their feet to move. Yeah, you know, I think it's that's something that motivates me every day to say that, you know what, there is a disconnect right now. between what people are willing to say in public and what people are willing to say in private okay the fact that we had 300 million dollars in in you know less than a month or whatever that what is that what is that really that's someone speaking speaking anonymously right so, so a lot of people may have, feel like they have to take the risk of putting food on the dinner table if they're going to speak their mind freely because they might lose their job right. well that's a, that's a risk thankfully i don't have to worry about putting food on the dinner table at this stage so if i'm and i found it to be difficult to take this risk so if i'm going to find it that difficult to take this risk i wonder how difficult that's going to be for americans across the country the thing that we want to do is to close that gap right and i i think that is the measure i say this i say this all the time i'll say it here too the best measure of the health of a democratic society is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public it is not the number of ballots cast every november that is just a fetish at the end of the process that's it's, it's important but it but that's just that's just the capstone to the process the real metric of a democratic health of a society is whether or not its citizenry feels free to express itself in public we are doing poorly we are doing as poorly as i can remember in my lifetime but i think that people are so hungry for change that my my challenge probably to every person in this room if you think about the one thing you could do that would have the biggest impact on our civic health is that when you find yourself in a room where you are the only person who believes what you do i i think you have a civic obligation now more than ever to actually with respect with dignity but without apology to express that view and, and i can almost make a commitment to you in return that if you do it without apology you will find that you probably were not the only person in that room who expressed your viewpoint. And I think that yes fear has been infectious over the last 10 years but I think that courage can be infectious too. It's just going to take people who are willing to exhibit that courage to start that domino effect across our culture. And at the end of the day I am optimistic. I think that's a really interesting point, fundamentally important because 
you have experience at this level and you know this, I mean, we've got a room full of, of very important donors and supporters of heritage as well as participants at our Young Leaders Program. And so invested in the future and literally the future, not only do they need that courage, not only do they need to feel that and express that, what is what is the what are the what is what is the way that you think about what a meritocracy is? You know, how do you, how do you think about how do you personalize that? How do you make that something that is part of your ethos every day? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, so this is you know this is heavy duty stuff. It's part of why it takes a book to to explore. Is I think yeah, if you're going to call for the revival of meritocracy, well, you might might as well talk about what merit actually means. So so for an institution. You know, and this is, this is what I'm going to talk about. It's completely an apolitical idea here. But, but every institution owes it to itself to define what is its purpose. Every institution has to have a purpose. So, so Strive, for example, we don't second guess the purpose of a company. If you want to be a solar energy company, great. Be an excellent solar energy company. If you want to be a coal company, be a coal company. Disney's mission is to be the world's premier entertainment company. Great. I don't second guess that mission. If you decide that's a worthy mission for your institution, by God, pursue it. But then the question is, how do you as an institution best achieve that mission? You need people to achieve that mission. How do you administer rewards and select people and, and compensate people and elevate people in a manner that best aligns with your mission? And I think that's part of my issue with the capital D Church of Diversity, which imposes one monolithic conception. This is one example, but one monolithic conception of diversity on all institutions. Whereas I think the question we ought to be asking actually is what types of diversity does each institution need in order to advance its own mission and purpose? And that may mean that there's a diverse approach to even the question of diversity itself, right? So, so I may want diversity of skills in math and in writing, but I may not want diverse attitudes towards hard work or the diverse attitudes towards the worthiness of our mission. I'll give you one example. I mean, look, if, if you're running a steakhouse, you want to serve great steak to people who eat at your restaurant. You probably don't want diversity, even the ever-prized diversity of opinion, on whether it's wrong to kill animals for culinary pleasure. <laughs> I, I, I would make a poor employee for a steakhouse. I'm a vegetarian for that reason. So I would not be a good employee of a steakhouse for, for that reason, among others. And so, And so at the end of the day, I think that this is not a political concept. This is a question about reviving institutional purpose. And I think that that's something we've lost in American life, right. is that we've come up with the idea of institutional sameness as a substitute for institutional distinctiveness, both amongst companies, both amongst nonprofits, amongst universities, and then even within the different spheres of our lives. Capitalism has one promise for the role it fills in a society. Democratic elected government has a different promise for the role that it fills in society. Same goes for the church or for religious spheres of our lives. And, and I think that we live in this moment where there's a there's a siren song, a, a tempting call to dissolve the boundaries between those institutions to create a single monolithic purpose across all of them. And that really loses, to bring it full circle, the irony of what true American pluralism, true American diversity is all about. It's about preserving the integrity of each of those institutions, sometimes by actually keeping them separate from one another. That's a that's an excellent point. As power becomes sort of centralized and bureaucratized, you know, you lose so much. And this is why the political left doesn't care what you do as long as it's compulsory. One of the things that I think would be interesting to hear from you about meritocracy, about the centralization of sort of power and authority, would be how you view China vis-a-vis -vis all of this. And then I do want to open it up for questions from from our friends here in, in the audience. And I know that's kind of a big question, but, yeah, but big you question. certainly write about it in the book and you've pulled pulled that thread through many of your commentaries to date. Yeah, so I do think uh, there's so much to say about this. I'll say a few things and maybe we can take more in, in Q&A. I do think it is the question of our time, okay? Uh, I, I explore the history of Rome and Carthage in the book. And I think that sometimes we indulge ourselves by asking ourselves the humble brag question, are we Rome and in decline? You know, Roman, the Roman Empire lasted for thousands of years, okay, a couple thousand years nearly. Uh, we would be so lucky as to be Rome. We may be more apt to ask ourselves the question of whether we are Carthage. And I think that the, the history, I, I, say, I say that non-jokingly, and, and Sicily drew them into conflict. You know, the, Taiwan may be the Sicily of our time. This is a, a multi-hour discussion for another day. But one of the interesting features I do observe is, is the way in which our once unabashed culture of excellence, of meritocracy, by the way, has leapt oceans to lift up places like China. 
And then their Maoist culture of victimhood has leapt oceans in the other direction to infect the United States. And if you think that's an accident of history, you might be missing the fact that this is actually part of a broader, well-thought Chinese vision for their thousand-year plan in many ways using those, so this ties back to Woke Inc., but using the American companies that serve us our food, but not only our food, but increasingly our messages in our national psyche, to use them as the vehicles for perpetuating that agenda here as a condition for market entry in China. And so in some ways, our cultural malaise is not just an accident of history and incumbency and the ebbs and flows. I think this is there's a there's a part of this that is the intentional geopolitical goal of the modern Chinese communist state, and I'm sorry to say that they have actually used American capitalism itself as a vector, as a Trojan horse, to accomplish what they never could have accomplished if it weren't for the fact that they were able to do it from within. And that's a multi-hour conversation. We can take more of that in the Q&A, but I think that once you see it with clear eyes, I think it's the first step to finding our way towards a complicated solution. Wonderfully well put. We'd like to open it up if there's any questions from the audience. Yes, sir, right up front. Rick, here's a microphone coming if you don't mind. Wait one second. Thank you very much for this book. Very thought provoking. One question in terms of solving problems in, in returning to a culture of excellence rather than a culture of victimhood. I think the most difficult problem is solving what you refer to as the Wilt Chamberlain paradox. Could you talk about that a little bit and how you think the best means of solving that problem? Yes. Yeah, so, so look, I, without without getting it, without sort of um, you know belaboring uh, you know that that particular storyline in the book and ruining it for everybody. But at, at, at the end of the day, I, I, I will just, I'll just sort of step it back to sort of the the attack on meritocracy and the attack on achievement. Okay, wherever it's going to be a domain, wherever whether it's going to be on the basketball court, whether it's Will Chamberlain or whether it's going to be in an engineering exam in, you know, to get into an engineering college, you're going to have people who are naturally, no matter what obstacles you put in their way, are going to be the ones who rise at the end to the top. And I think that we should embrace that rather than trying to correct for it or apologize for it. And I think that there's three cases for it. I think one is by way of national competitiveness itself. Uh, I think we lose our national competitiveness on a global stage when other countries are allocating rewards on that same basis. But I think that there's something that, that respects the essence of the activity itself, res respects the essence of basketball itself. If our goal isn't to sort of set up a paradox for the likes of Wilt Chamberlain to have to apologize for what they do, to rather allow a system, because that's what's going to happen anyway. At the end of the day, that's kind of what, what the point of that little a vignette in the book is about is this Will Chamberlain paradox is no matter what you do, he's going to actually be the end of the person who succeeds at the end anyway. You might as well structure our system in a way that doesn't apologize for that or attenuates that, but rather embraces that as its core competitive advantage. And there's a, um, I'm trying to remember who wrote which which uh, who wrote this who wrote this story. Um, maybe it was a Kurt Vonnegut uh, story, where I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who, uh, you know, had had a story of. of a dystopian society in which all smart people were forced to listen to loud music so that their thoughts could be attenuated. All strong people were supposed to wear weights on their chest so that they wouldn't be as fast as the weaker people. And in a certain sense, it sounds like you know, Kurt Vonnegut wrote this decades ago. It's not that dissimilar from the anti-meritocratic culture that we've created in the United States. And, and the point of the, the Wilt Chamberlain anal the, the little story I tell in the book is that Actually, even if you put the weights on the on the strong or, or put the loud noises in the ears of the intelligent, they're still going to be the ones who generally rise to the top of their respective fields, but just be less effective in a way that leaves us all worse off in the end. And, you know, in a, in a certain sense, these aren't analogies anymore. You, t you talk about enough of those analogies or allegories, you realize that you're just describing, actually, it's not a thought experiment. It's just a description of modern American reality. Now, the point isn't just to critique for the sake of critiquing, because I think that once you're able to see the problem with clear eyes, you know, that's at least that at least paves the way towards our path to a solution. But anyway, thanks for that question. I, I really enjoyed that part of the book and didn't want to, you know, spoil it for those who are going to read it. But that's that's the punchline. The name of that the name of that story is Harrison Bergeron by, yes, Kurt, by right. Kurt Vonnegut. Read that after you read Vivek's book, of course. We've got a, yes, ma'am. Microphone right here. I have a question concerning timeline. Uh, do you envision uh, how long it would take to make this cultural change? And to put it in historical context, uh, it is said that the uh, 
Enlightenment started 100 years before the American Revolution revealed its, its principles. So what is your timeline, or do you or have a vision for one? Yeah, so I have a vision for what I think it needs to be. Whether it will be or not, I think, is, is not something that we're going to watch as bystanders. It's what we're going to play a role in determining whether or not we achieve this timeline. I think, I think the kids who enter kindergarten today graduate from 12th grade before we finish our work. I think that we lose a generation, and I don't think we have a generation left in our in our thin bones left to bear. Okay, so that might be the beginning of the end as we know it if, if we you know, don't work within solving these cultural dilemmas over the course of the next 10 to 12 years. Broad strokes, that'd be a direct answer to your question. Now, from a historical perspective, one of the reasons I like looking at history is that it offers us, um, you know, I think it's some comfort at times. You look at times where the American experiment has been tested at many points through our own history, this wouldn't be the first. America has proven resilient time and again at rising to the occasion precisely when it was under the greatest pressure to do so. Even if you look at the history of Rome, you know, we, one of the things I had to refresh myself on in terms of preparation to write this book was that we tell ourselves this narrative of the rise and fall of Rome and maybe draw an analogy about the rise and fall of the American experiment. And actually, that's a pretty low resolution description of even the history of Rome. There were many rises and there were many falls. And I think that there will be many rises and many falls of the American experiment as well. It's not one unidirectional rise and then one unidirectional fall. And so, you know, I think some of this also, um, not to get too abstract about this, but, you know, America, like Rome, was a country that, and is a country, built on an idea, right? It's not about the geographic boundaries that really define our place. We're not just a group of higher mammals roaming a common geographic terrain doing what our iPhones tell us to do on a given day, you know, <laughs> that would be, a, that would be a, a depressing vision of a nation, certainly ours. We're, we're not even a nation built on, like many European countries, by the way, on a common genetic identity. You know, this is difficult to say out loud, but I think many European nations are built on a common shared genetic stock or a food or a language or, you know, you think about Great Britain in recent weeks, around a monarch, no. We're built around a shared set of ideas that bound together an otherwise divided polyglot group of people 250 years ago. And I think that when you say that, what is our work in that next 10 to 12 year period? Our work is to revive those shared national ideals that otherwise bound that divided polyglot group of people together. Because that might not be the work that Italy needs to do. Italy might have different work to do, or Hungary might have different work to do. But the American work to do is that our identity is based on reviving those shared ideals and I think that has implications for this is just a side rant here, but it's it's a um, it's it's illustrative of what I mean about w fixing the problem. What do we mean? Let's just take an, an example of a topic that I don't touch in my book, but I think th the book has implications for. Say the immigration debate. Okay, I, I think I think there are real ways in which immigration can threaten a nation's core identity. In for example, in the European context, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I think those are difficult struggles. In the American context, though, because our identity is not based on a shared genetic stock or, or visual makeup or, or linguistic makeup even, I think that the thing that we ought to be focused on is making sure that the people who immigrate to this country and, and do so legally are committed to the ideals that define who we are as Americans and at its best can be actually a source of reviving the lifeblood of a country and a national identity rather than a source of eroding that national identity. And so I think that once we again come up with a clear-eyed vision of what we think it means to be an American in the year 2022, what are the ideals that define what it means to be an American, then I think we could put that at the at the forefront as the north star of both our, our policy frontiers as well as our as well as our cultural frontiers over that next 10 to 12 year time frame that we're working with. Great answer, great question. Jorge, right down front. Hold on, let's get the microphone to you. Thank you, hello. Yeah. Uh, good to see you again. I've seen you in many different uh, forum, uh, for example, National Review Institute and others. So um, we're excited to get actually closer to you as opposed to seeing from afar. Um, from my own experience, uh, I was speaking of victim, nation of victims, I was born in Cuba, and my family and I, we came over as exiles from communism, from socialism, another socialist experiment that didn't work out either. And the Cuban immigration, the Cuban, not immigration, but the Cuban refugees, which is different, uh, that settled in South Florida, uh, of all the people that could have embraced victimhood, we could have, but we didn't. 
and we became very successful uh, in a way that I think many Americans who were born here and raised here and have generations of freedom and democracy to look back on have simply taken for granted. But having lost our freedom and our democracy and the great wealth that Cuba had for 400 years, um, we took nothing for granted. So early on in the refugee experience, uh, many, first of all, many people didn't realize how to treat us because here we were Cubans, mostly Spanish descent, but we, we had to be categorized as what color. I remember having to fill out as a child, white, black, Hispanic, and you know, literally asking, well, can I check more than one box? But, uh, and this didn't exist in the Hispanic world. Um, but what we did in, in South Florida and ended up changing Florida's history uh, for the better, I believe, um, is that we rebuilt all the structures that we had, that it was stolen from us by socialism. We rebuilt the churches, uh, so Cubans are devoutly Catholic. Uh, we rebuilt the families. And we also reestablished many of the companies and institutions from Bacardi, from others that you might be familiar with. And we connected it back to our history, like for example, uh, the great Jesuit school, uh, Belen, uh, that was in Cuba, which Fidel Castro graduated from, unfortunately. But um, there was, it was reopened in Miami. Um, and also, there was an initial attempt, and I'll try to make it quick. I know you have time on this. We'll pass quick, uh, but go ahead. I'll yeah. give you the whole history of uh, the Cuban immigration exper refugee experience. But um, the, we refused to accept the affirmative action um, um, preferences that we were given because that was a, an act of dishonor. And we eventually were able to achieve, succeed, and sort of flip Florida to another political entity. And we have Governor DeSantis, and we have the great free state of Florida. Is it the, the um, lack of gratitude or maybe taking for granted the freedoms that this country's had? for centuries and assuming that it just exists in the air and we could just take it for granted. Is that the reason why so many Americans feel that? So, so look, I think that, um, I think that's a, that's a very important question to reflect on actually. Uh, I do think that victimhood is in part a product of incumbency. Okay, so we are living in the middle of the largest intergenerational wealth transfer in human history here on American soil from baby boomers to millennials. And I think there is a journey from, you know, in your status as an insurgent to then becoming an incumbent. Incumbency leads to laziness. And you know what? Victimhood fits laziness like a glove because it justifies your laziness, right? It's not just about, it's not just about you being a sloth, right? Living, a, living out a biblical sin. It is actually you justifying that sloth as part of the grand fight against the oppression of capitalism. And this is actually in the anti-work movement, even in our culture over the last year, you see a lot of these comments. It's not just that I wanna stay home, I wanna stay home because this is about actually fighting the shackles of oppression. And so I do think that that's a big part of victimhood culture is it originates with the laziness that itself is a product of incumbency. In the first chapter of the book, I talk about that the tug of war for the heart of the American soul right now is the competition between the two close cousins of the victim and the underdog. And I think what you described, the journey of you, not only your own admirable journey, but those are many Cuban Americans, those are many legal immigrants who came to this country, even if there was refugees from Cuba, to come as underdogs. And I think the underdog will always outcompete the victim. But they're, they're, the struggle between the two is, I think, the cultural struggle at the heart of the American soul today. And as for checking the boxes, you know, Hispanic, black, white, whatever, I, I've always kind of been in favor of, like, we should just add a new box that just says American. And... and <laughs> And, and let you check the American box. It might make things a little easier. <laughs> that is great. I think we have time for one or two more, I think, that we do. But uh, one more. Uh, thank you, Jorge, for your service in the Trump administration. Thank you for that, that question and comment. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, thank you. Like you, um, Angela and I are part of the Ohio experiment. And curious if you have any thoughts on succeeding Mike DeWine in the future. Uh, on... on how to succeed Mike DeWine or myself doing it? If you have any no, plans. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm not, um, I, so I I'll be very honest with you. I, I considered a political career briefly as I was transitioning out of my past business role. Um, I, I was a biotech CEO, as Andy mentioned, then I stepped down to write Woke Inc. I could not do that in my seat as a, as a biotech CEO. And, and so that was a transition for me. I thought that transition might lead to a path in politics. I considered the Senate race in, in Ohio 
kind of playing out this year. Decided against it uh, in part because, you know, as the expression goes, I guess, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, and you know, if, <laughs> if you're a lawmaker, you pass laws. <laughs> and, and I'm not certain that the nature of the cultural problems that we've just spent the last half hour talking about are principally solved through lawmaking. I'm not saying lawmaking doesn't have a role. I, I believe it probably does, actually. But I'm not sure that it actually hits so-called that nail on the head. And, and I am far more interested in playing whatever role. We each have to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, how do we use our talents to drive the kind of change we want to see in the world? And when I looked in the mirror as I was considering that political career, I didn't want to shoehorn cultural, economic challenges into the, you know, short, the narrow constraints of lawmaking as the way that we might presuppose we're going about fixing it. And so for me, I was far more drawn to the combination of building businesses and speaking with the clarity that I hope, or at least with an honesty that many other business leaders, at least in public, were less willing to take on themselves and hope to see what kind of change that can't achieve in the meantime, as others do their work in the political sphere. And here's the other reason why, too, is, is I think that I hope, at least, that much of what I have to say in the books, much of what I have to say you know, through our work at Strive, transcends the boundaries of political partisanship. I mean, these really aren't red or blue ideas. These are not you know, black or white ideas or Republican or Democratic ideas. And I went on Bill Maher's show last Friday. I mean, why do I love doing stuff like that? You're reaching audiences that, you know, ought to be motivated by some of these messages. But once you wear your partisan jersey, as you must, in the field of electoral politics, you lose, in today's climate, the ability to drive change, not amongst the people who already believe in what you do, but amongst the kinds of people who you might hope to bring along. And I think we might have a better chance of doing that in our economy and, our, and in our culture than through our politics. So that's why I'm probably not going to pursue that path. Great question, though. I think that's been on the mind of a lot of people. Thank you, Vivek, very much. I think, you know, what you're doing, you're changing incentive structures, you're creating political will for others, and the way you're doing it, I think it's a Shakespeare line that even in life of soliloquy can become a grand performance, but you have changed the tenor of the debate, you have changed the manner of the debate, and you are driving so much towards this path to excellence that we all can embrace, and so we thank you for joining us today, and thank I appreciate you. it very much. Thank Please you all. And I think...